next speaker is Anton McCaffrey, and he will talk about optimizing mRNA for gene therapy applications, evaluation of novel nucleotide modifications for improved activity. All right. Well, thank you to the organizers for uh, the opportunity to speak. Um, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about some work we're doing at TriLink with uh, modified mRNAs and use of uh, modified nucleotides to um, improve the immunogenicity of these different compounds. So for those of you who are not familiar with uh, mRNA as a therapeutic, um, this is a relatively recent uh, point of interest, and so I thought I'd talk a little bit about why mRNA. Um, so one of the main reasons that people have become interested lately in messenger RNA is that um, there have been some issues in uh, some clinical trials, for example, in a, a SCID trial in Europe with a lentivirus that and resulted in insertional mutagenesis and leukemia in the children that were treated. Um, plasmid and viral vectors are commonly used um, in gene therapy, but they can elicit an innate immune response. Um, mRNA has the advantage that it can transfect, difficult to transfect cells because the target compartment for the mRNA is the cytoplasm, and so cells that are not rapidly dividing, for example, can be difficult to transfect because the plasmid or mRNA gets access to the nucleus during cell division. Um, and there's some applications that benefit from a short transient expression, um, for example, genome editing tools such as zinc fingers, talons, uh, Cas9 and CRISPR, and uh, also other applications such as vaccines. So um, what distinguishes a uh, self-RNA from a non-self-RNA? So several things. So one is location. So uh, RNAs belong in the nucleus or the cytoplasm. Um, they don't belong outside of cells or in endosomes. Um, so the cell recognizes the RNA by the location. Um, Self-RNAs are also post-transcriptionally processed, and so you get things like um, methylation of your cap structures and things like that. Um, they tend to lack, lack long double-stranded regions, and uh, they lack viral structural elements. So there are a number of uh, innate immune pattern rec recognition receptors that recognize RNAs. Um, so for example, toll-like receptors, uh, 3, 7, and 8 recognize RNAs, and those are predominantly found in endosomes. Um, there's also a series of cytosolic sensors such as uh, PKR, RIG-I, IFITS, and MDA5 that also uh, recognize uh, aberrant RNAs inside the cell. So this field was really pushed forward um, by some seminal work by uh, Caitlin Carrico and Drew Weissman uh, quite a number of years now where they showed that um, you know, wild-type RNAs induce innate immune responses, but RNAs that have been modified with pseudo-U and or 5-methyl-C um, they found reduced binding to innate immune sensors in vitro, reduced toxicity, prolonged expression in cultured cells in in vivo, um, and they, they also found that pseudo-U modification increased translation in vitro. Other groups, such as Michael Corman's, uh, showed that uh, partial substitution with tooth IOU could reduce toxicity of messenger RNAs. So we wanted to ask whether or not we could improve over um, pseudo-U, which is kind of the, the industry standard. And to date, there had been no large um, published large-scale screens of different modified bases in culture. Um, so TriLink, um, we have the largest collection of modified NTPs in the world, so it was kind of a natural thing for us. We make things like including pseudo-U. Um, and we also have a team of chemists that's great at uh, making new modified NTPs, and so we sat down and scratched our heads and figured out you know, what are some new things that we could try? So we synthesized a, a number of novel NTPs. And then we made uh, about 27 different combinations of um, modified nucleotides in an EGFP background and a luciferase background. And then went ahead to test these. So um, the first thing we did was to look um, whether or not they could be incorporated by T7 polymerase, because you can't easily make an mRNA without that. Uh, we measured their translational capacity in an in vitro translation system, rabbit reticulocyte lysates. And then we looked at expression of uh, EGFP and luciferase in six cultured cell lines. And uh, kind of what, an area that we're moving into now in a collaboration with Phil Santangelo's lab at uh, Georgia Tech is to look at single molecule imaging to look at which patterns of innate immune sensors are binding different modified RNAs. So this is just the in vitro translation um, experiment. And you can see here, wild type, um, for reference, this is an unmodified RNA. And so you can see that some of these did not translate at all. And some of these translated better than the wild type. So as reported, pseudo-U. And another one that we'll come back to in a minute, N1-methyl pseudo-U also had enhanced translation 
um, in this rabbit reticulocyte system. So the next thing we did was move into the tissue culture, and we did this as a, a collaboration um, with uh, Joel Jesse at Molecular Transfer, um, and they looked at six different cell lines, so, so uh, adipose mesenchymal, fibroblasts, uh, HeLa cells, HUVEC cells, uh, neural stem cells, and a, a neuroblastoma. So they have a reagent called mRNA in. Um, so they were the folks that developed the um, lipofectamine reagents um, that, at Invitrogen that you probably all have used. And they have a um, cationic lipophilic nanoparticle, and it transfects um, cells pretty well with messenger RNA. Here's just an example. In uh, some IPS cells, you can get basically 100% of the cells transfected um, with these messenger RNAs. So there's quite a, few, quite a bit of data, and it's hard to present on one slide. So I thought I'd start off by just eliminating the ones that didn't work at all. So I'm not going to show you data on these ones. These, aren't, um, these ones didn't work at all. Um, interestingly, N6-methyl uh, A is actually found in, in naturally occurring mRNAs, but not in a body-labeled kind of setting. All right, so this is kind of a complicated slide, but basically it summarizes the data across the different cell lines. And um, for reference, wild type is the last bar in each set. Um, and you can see, for example, that here in black is pseudo U. Um, in all cases, what we found in the GFP context was that N1-methyl pseudo U actually performed superior to pseudo U. And interestingly, a, a novel modification that we had made, 5-methoxy-UTP, um, looked to be about as good as pseudo U in, in basically all of these different cell types. Another interesting observation is that there are cell type specific differences in the responses to the different chemically modified RNAs. So for example, the neural stem cells and the neuroblastoma cells seem to be less picky about which um, pattern of chemical modifications was used. And uh, so that may reflect different uh, expression of innate immune sensors in the cell. We're just in the process of kind of starting to look at those sorts of things to see if we can make some correlations. Um, People also commonly use a combination of pseudo-U and 5-methyl-C. That's uh, what Caitlin Carrico had originally published. And what we found was, if you compare kind of the first bar to the third bar, that the addition of the second nucleotide did not seem to improve the activity. In fact, it diminished it. So pseudo-U could improve the activity of 5-methyl-C, but not the, the other way around. I don't have time to show you the other combinations, but generally that was an observation we found, is that um, combining two modifications tended to result in lower activity. Okay, so the next question we wanted to answer was whether or not the primary sequence of the mRNA influenced which modification pattern worked the best. And that was the reason we'd made both the, the GFP series and the luciferase series. So we performed the transfections with the luciferase RNAs um, in the same cell lines and saw some, largely the rank order was the same, but in some cases it was different. But as we dug under a little bit more, what we realized is that if we looked at the quality of the transcriptions, they were variable with the different modifications, um, and they were varied between GFP and luciferase. So in the, here's just a bioanalyzer trace of, a, of an mRNA, this, in this case luciferase. You can see there's failure sequences at the beginning where the polymerase is prematurely terminated, and there's some higher molecular weight stuff on the back end. Um, after HPLC purification of the messenger RNA, you get a cleaner peak got a higher, um, a higher peak there. And so we're in the process right now of going through an HPLC purifying all the RNAs so that we have a more accurate apples to apples comparison. So I can't really tell you today about the sequence context effect, but stay tuned for next time you see me talk. All right, so changing uh, gears just a little bit here is that we have a, a nice collaboration that we've just started with Phil Santangelo and Jonathan Kirschman at Georgia Tech. And they do a lot of uh, single molecule imaging um, studies, and they're able to look at um, the interaction of individual mRNA molecules with different proteins inside the cell. Um, this is an area that they, they're specializing in, so I don't know I can answer any really complex questions about their, their system, but um, to begin with, what they did was they started looking at stress granule formation um, in cells upon treatment with the RNAs. So stress granules are dense aggregates of RNP complexes that are uh, typically associated with stalled translational states, and they're shown here in red. And what they found, I hope this is visible from the back there, here's a control cell um, stained for this marker for uh, stress granules, 
And in unmodified RNA elicits the formation of a lot of stress granules, and that's attenuated somewhat by 5-methyl-C and further attenuated when you have a modification with pseudo-U. Um, so these studies are just beginning. We're about to do the studies where we look at the interaction of the different, um, the different uh, RNAs with individual components of those uh, innate immune sensors that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. So we're really excited about that. This is just the quantitation of the um, stress granule formation. You can see at five hours, you have, it's attenuated with pseudo-U, and by 24 hours, these are, are largely going away. So in summary, um, we have synthesized numerous novel NTPs, and we're just beginning to play with them. Um, the individual NTPs are combinations of, of NTPs were used to transcribe luciferase and EGFPM RNAs. Several of these modified nucleotides enhance translation in in vitro systems. Um, we screened these against six different cell types, and several modifications were comparable or superior to pseudo-U. In most cases, single substitutions were superior to combinations of, of modifications. And um, the pseudo-U mod modified RNAs produced the fewest stress granules, and we're now going back and looking at the rest of the different combinations of modifications that we, we found. So in the future, um, we're doing the HPLC purification of the mRNA. Um, HPLC purification of mRNA is not a trivial thing. We've actually spent about three years figuring out how to do it, and we uh, now have scalable methods for, for, produ or for doing um, purification of messenger RNAs. Um, we're going to look at toxicity, dose responses, and cytokine measurements, time courses to look at the stability of the RNA, because the uh, overall expression is really a combination of a lot of different things, including you know, uptake, innate immune responses, stability, so it's kind of complicated. Very excited to look at interactions with different innate immune sensors to see whether or not we can find some patterns and then now have a basis to do structure activity relationship studies um, to improve the NTP designs. And uh, just a, a little two shameless plugs here. Um, we recently opened a, a GMP facility at Trilink for making messenger RNAs, oligonucleotides, and NTPs. Um, this is targeted at early stage um, clinical trials and talk studies. We're um, making an effort to make this as affordable as possible for small studies. Um, and the other plug I wanted to put in is that, you know, these modified RNAs incorporate with T7 RNA polymerase, and it may be interesting to look in the context of aptamers. Um, we've also done some studies to look at which ones are, you know, amenable to RT-PCR, and we have that data. We're happy to share with folks um, lists of NTPs that are incorporated, uh, incorporatable by T7 polymerase and the ones that can be RT-PCR'd, and if you guys would like to throw them into your selects experiments and see what kind of interesting things pop out. Had a nice earlier talk about chemical modifications improving aptamers, and I think that really we have only begun to kind of explore that space. And so those NTPs are available. You can buy them. You know, they're very inexpensive. And then lastly, I want to thank the people who actually did the work, because I didn't, of course, didn't do any of these experiments myself. Um, so Richard Hogarfee is our CEO and also a great chemist and drove the production of the modified NTPs. Chris Dezizian and Julie Powers runs our mRNA production group, um, which made thousands of messenger RNAs now. Um, Alexander Lebedev and Dagwan Shin um, were the chemists who made the NTPs. Um, the transfection experiments were done at molecular transfer, um, mainly uh, uh, driven by Joel Jesse. And uh, we'd like to thank our collaborators at Georgia Tech, Phil Santangelo and Jonathan Kirschman. We're really excited about the uh, studies that they're embarking on. And if you have questions, there's my contact information. Thank you, Anton. <laughs> questions? Yes. Thanks. Sorry if I missed it, but uh, about what percent of uh, bases in the luciferase RNA w were the novel nucleotides versus uh, naturals? Uh, and then a second question, uh, have, have you made any uh, um, phosphoramidites out of these for, for uh, making uh, oligos? Uh, so all of these experiments were done with 100% substitution of the modified NTP, so the different uh, sequences have different base compositions, but um, you know, anywhere about between 15 and 25 percent of the nu nucleotides are modified, but 100 percent of the U's or the 100 percent of the C's would be uh, modified. We also have some combinations where we've done doping in. Uh, we haven't actually tested those yet, but that's kind of in the works. And um, the second answer is that, uh, yes, we're converting some. So we, we make phosphoramidites is one of the things we do. And so 
yeah, the, these, you should be able to get these. If, if there's one in particular that we don't have, we probably could, could make it for you. Okay, hi. Um, this uh, different influence of the modifications in the different cell lines, do you think this could be due to different protein binding protein, uh, RNA binding proteins that are expressed differentially in these cell lines that have a different affinity for the modified RNAs? So my guess is that, you know, we know that different cell lines, for example, some cell lines like hepatocytes don't express um, a lot of toll-like receptors. Different cell lines express these proteins at different levels, and I suspect that that's what it's going to turn out to be. Um, whether we would see differential binding for this, you know, say, PKR in one cell type versus the other, we don't really know, but uh, we should be able to get at those uh, experiments with, you know, Phil um, should get at that, um, but I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, apart from the immune sensors, but just um, um, proteins that will enhance translation or that has a, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that is clearly a possibility. So there's many, many different layers at which you could have an increase in activity. And, that, and that's part of the reason we did the in vitro translation is that we're trying to tease apart, um, you know, what is the element that's important. You know, you could imagine endosomal escape, um, you know, translation efficiency inside the cell, RNA stability, you know, there's a whole host. It could be that they're lo localized to a different part of the cell. There's, you know, many, many different possible reasons why they could have an enhanced activity here. What is the size of the mRNA you tried? Uh, the GFP construct is about 1,000 bases. The luciferase is just short of 2,000. Um, but we've made RNAs as long as 16,000 bases. Okay. You noticed a significant difference between the pre-purified and purified mRNA? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? You noticed a significant difference in the activity before and after purification of the mRNA you showed? So we've done some experiments um, in collaboration with John Rossi's lab where we looked at a, a previous generation of this HPLC. And I, I tell you that you know there's some published HPLC methods out there that for mRNA that we don't really like very much. And so our newest generation of HPLC purification is, is quite different from that. It's a little bit outside of the box, but when we use kind of our previous generation of um, HPLC purification, what we found is that the activity was increased upon HPLC purification, um, but that was compared to a silica membrane um, purification, which actually does a fairly good job of making a non-immunogenic or a less immunogenic mRNA. And so the activity was roughly proportional to the amount of enrichment for the full length sequence. So if we'd thrown away three quarters of the, the material, it was about four times as active in primary human dendritic cells. But we haven't gone back and done that experiment um, using the kind of new generation of HPLC. So the, the previous generation was scalable, you know, maybe to hundreds of milligrams. And, you know, going into GMP manufacturing, we need to anticipate, you know, being able to make these things at kilogram scales. And so. Um, we had to change some things in our HPLC purification so what, to kind of what accommodate What kind that. of columns are used for purification? I can't really comment too much on the purification method because it's proprietary. All right, if there are no further questions, thanks again.